Okay, welcome everybody to the May office hours. We're getting close to the end of the school year. I'm sure everyone <laughs> is feeling good about that. Um, I know uh, Didi and I have a little bit longer, but uh, yeah, we're ready to wind down the year too. So um, I'm gonna go ahead, like I said, welcome, and then we'll um, go ahead and start. Um, Didi, if you'll advance, I'll go ahead and do today's topics. Okay, um, we went off of just some information or phone calls we've recently had. And then, um, like, I, like we've always said, be sure to, you know, ask us other questions um, that you might have once we go through these topics. So today's topics are eligib eligibility determination different than suspicion on plan. So you think you've got a different uh, eligibility, what do you do? Change in suspicion after eval has started. Um, Re-eval ETR timeline from consent. Protocol for discharging therapy during an annual IEP. Who must lead an FBA or BIP? And required hours for home instruction. Uh, Didi and I are in an IDA review, so some things have come up to the top for that review, but then also we've had just random emails or phone calls with um, these questions again. So um, go ahead, Dee Dee. Thanks, Helen. Okay, so our first question is, um, if the planning form uh, indicates that the team is considering one or more disability categories, so for example, uh, the team has listed a suspicion of possible developmental delay or SLD. The question is, what happens um, after all of the testing is done, all the information is gathered, and when the team is at the meeting, they decide that there's another category that is a better fit, for example, autism, or whatever the case may be. Is it okay to go ahead and change that eligibility? And here's what I'm going to say. In rare circumstances, that may occur. Yes, technically, you can do that. However, please hear this strong word of caution. That should happen very, very rarely. If you begin the evaluation process and you realize that you are suspecting something other than what you started with, um, then you should amend that planning form right away and, uh, you know, send a PR01 explaining that you've, you know, changed the planning form. You're going to get the parent signature. Everybody's going to initial it. Um, and I'm going to actually talk about that in the, in the next slide. But because that would be something that could happen, it is very, very unlikely that a team would go through the entire process and then at the last minute in the 11th hour, when you're sitting down reviewing everything with the parent, the team suddenly decides that it occurs to everyone that, oh, maybe this isn't the right category. Um, the reason that I say that that should be a rare occurrence and you should have, you should proceed with extreme caution is what does that say about the whole evaluation process that you've gone through? In some ways, it almost is saying it negates everything that you've done, that you were not um, proceeding through the process with a clear direction in mind. And you could argue that, you know, one of the areas for compliance is that the ETR addresses all areas of need. Well, if you weren't you didn't have a suspicion in mind, you weren't assessing for that, could you have missed assessments or could you have missed areas that you should have been focusing on, but you didn't? So hopefully that makes sense of why there would be concern around that. Um, again, there are rare times when that may actually happen. Um, maybe you received an ETR uh, a vow that was already in process when a, a child moved into your district um, and you're kind of picking up and, and moving forward because you're at the tail end. Uh, there, you know, there could be mitigating circumstances when that would happen. Again, I just want to use 
caution and strongly urge you to be very mindful towards the beginning of the process or even once you've started assessments to think about if things are popping up that seem like that might not fit or there are other concerns, then as a team, it is imperative that you sort of stop and take action then as opposed to, as I said, waiting until, you know, you're at the at the eligibility meeting. Um, but again, having said all that, yes, you can do it. This is what would need to occur. If that were to happen and you did find yourselves, you know, kind of scratching your heads at the at the meeting saying, ah, oh, this this really now that we're looking everything as a whole picture all together, you know, this does seem like a better fit. And sometimes that could happen because the parent is saying, I don't know, this sounds more like, you know, autism or this sounds more like OHI or whatever the case may be. Um, you would make sure that your justification was thorough in explaining that. Please remember that, um, and I know Helen and I have covered this in internal monitoring and we've talked about it multiple times, but it's worth repeating. In the eligibility section, that final piece, it is not enough if you had more than one area of suspicion on the planning form. It is not enough to simply say the student did not qualify for developmental delay, but rather SLD, and then give the rationale for why they met for SLD, you have to say why they did not meet for developmental delay. Whatever category you initially suspected, it's two parts. You have to say why they didn't meet that category and why they did meet the other category. So in a case like this, if you had one or more suspected areas, and then you ended up determining that it was something altogether different, you would have to put that in your justification statement, why the student, uh, why the team believed the student did not meet your initial susp suspected, excuse me, suspected areas, and why you landed on whatever you did, and then give the full justification for why the child meets uh, eligibility under that category. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that, um, don't forget, it's that two-pronged test. Not only does the child meet the definition and meet uh, under the category, um, but also that it adversely impacts their uh, progress in the general curriculum to the extent that they require specially designed instruction. That's that second piece. And um, you have to remember to include that explanation, that statement, uh, otherwise, it's it's non-compliant because it's that two-factor um, thing that we're looking for to determine, you know, why they don't need a 504. It's that specially designed instruction. So you have to make sure that you explain that as well. So I know that was a lengthy um, answer. I, this is a very nuanced, and I know it does happen on occasion. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands why we would be extremely cautious uh, in a scenario such as this. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. I will pause for just a second in case anyone has a question about that. Okay. All right, so this is really just the flip side to what I just talked about, um, that once the evaluation is started, what happens if you realize that you do suspect a different category and you need additional testing? What should you do in that circumstance? And that really should be the vast majority of when there's any kind of change, it should be this type of a scenario. You've started the process, you realize, oh, you know what? Maybe we should be looking at autism or maybe we should be looking at, uh, you know, OHI major, what, whatever it is. Um, and we might need to gather some information that we initially did not plan for. Um, this is pretty easy to take care of and much more straightforward. So you're just going to pull the team back together. That can be a Zoom. It can be over the phone, you know, however you need to do that. You need to change the uh, planning form. So you're just going to make a new planning form that includes the new suspected disability and um, any uh 
uh, additional assessments that you need to gather in this, uh, new information. You're going to include that on the new planning form. Everybody is going to initial it. You're going to get the parent signature. And then, of course, you're going to write a PRO1 explaining the changes that uh, the district is proposing and you know what the district is putting into place. Here is an important piece to remember. Anytime you make a change during the process, whether that is you're, you know, you're adding that you have assessments that you want to add or info that you want to gather, or in a case like this, um, you are changing or adding a suspected area of disability to the planning form. Um, all of those things are allowable as long as you get signatures and, you know, you document it all. It does not extend the timeline. So even when you make a change to your suspicion or what you need, that does not extend that 60-day timeline. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Helen. Okay. Must reval or ETRs be completed when, within 60 days of parental consent? And we just had this because of a psych being off for um, leave doesn't make any um, difference what it was for. Now, I always say 60 days. And if a parent would ask me, I'd say 60 days um, as best practice. However, the operating standards do not spe specify a timeline for reavals aside from it must be completed within the three-year time limit. Uh, I would never tell somebody that. Um, the 60 days from consent is only for an initial evaluation, and it is best practice for a reeval. So, quite honestly, I'd say just stick with your 60 days, uh, unless there's some um, mitigating circumstances. But from best practice, and what we say when we're talking with our teams, with our staff, and if a parent calls, we're going to save 60 days. Um, I know you, there are extenuating circumstances and that did just happen. And um, we went with, you know, it can uh, for a reavow, definitely not for an initial. So um, that's that. If anybody has had any questions about that, um, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute and ask any questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, Helen. Okay. So this is one, I know that we've talked about this in our office hours a couple of times, but it does come up um, quite a bit. There's still, I think, some confusion and very often a little bit of uh, nervousness trepidation when a team is looking at discharging a student from a therapy uh, standpoint through the, the annual IEP process. So we often get this question, what is the protocol? Um, do we have to have official testing? Do we have to go back and do a whole ETR for the student? And the answer is no, you do not have to uh, do a complete uh, ETR. Um, actually, you don't have to necessarily conduct a formal assessment for the child. If, uh, if you have the data to show that the student is, is no longer needing the related service, whatever it is, that they have uh, achieved everything that they needed to, they've mastered everything, and that it is no longer uh, a barrier to their accessing the general curriculum, it's not interfering and impeding with their education, you're going to have that data. As a related service provider, you know, you're constantly assessing the student. So you don't have to engage in a, you know, a formal uh, assessment like you would for an ETR. You're going to have all of that data. You're going to have all of that uh, assessment information from your ongoing work with the student. So what you do have to do is um, you have to, you know, include that information in the IEP. We would strongly suggest you put it in the profile that the student, you know, had been receiving speech or had been receiving PT or OT, whatever it is, or even uh, counseling services, if that's the case. 
and then have your explanation and your description of the student's progress, have your data, uh, give you know an explanation of why the student is able to be exited from that particular service. And then you are going to also include that in the PR01. And as a reminder, um, I know that we've shared this um, multiple times in the past, but we're gonna share it again. Um, OEC has a great memo uh, that was put out in uh, 2018, something like that, um, that gives a really nice, clear description of how you are to um, go about that. And it covers both adding a, a service and exiting a student from a service um, without um, a formal you know, ETR and all of that. Now, it is a little bit different if you are adding, you do have to do an assessment. You don't have to do a full scale um, ETR evaluation across the board, but you do have to um, evaluate just for that area that you're adding. Removing is a little bit easier. Like I said, you just, you're already going to have that data and all you're going to do is you're going to um, include that in the profile and then obviously in the PR01. In the chat, I have dropped in that memo that I referred to from um, ODE and OD, uh, sorry, DEW <laughs> and the Office of Exceptional Children. Um, I have dropped that into the chat so you have that uh, to take a look at. All right, I, any questions about that? I'm gonna assume not, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Helen. Okay, must a school psych lead an FBA in a BIP? Can someone else lead? Yes, someone else can lead an FBA and a BIP, although it, um, it's more, you know, it's desired that the psych be the lead, but there's no requirement for that. So it's important that someone has a skill set to interpret the results and knows what to ask. And most important factor is that the FBA be done as a team rather than one person. And I just want to take the opportunity to say here, you know, you can have an FBA in a bit for someone that's not on an IEP. Um, of course, you would be looking at maybe patterns of behavior. We had this just come up um, where a kid was possibly going to get expelled and the district had suspected a disability. Um, there were patterns of behavior and there was no uh, FBA or BIP. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, that kid um, should be having a MDR and possibly the, the, the infraction was related to um, his disability. So just kind of wanted to bring that up because that's kind of why this FBA and BIP came up because we've talked about it before, but I also just wanted to make sure that people know that, you know, we say a psych, but even in the uh, review we've been in, it comes up, um, it came up a few times and it's like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the psych, but it has to be somebody with a skill set. But also, you know, when, you know, a kid that's got a behavior, sure, they've got like a pattern of behavior. You're going to be looking at that to see if there, unless there's been trauma, recent trauma or something, um, you're going to be looking at that to, you know, document patterns and looking at, you know, is this related to a disability? So just kind of wanted to go over that because that did just come up recently and, um, it also came up in a situation where the psych wasn't available, but also it came up in another situation where, you know, the kid was up for an MDR, but the district had suspected a disability, just hadn't gotten to the evaluation, even though there were patterns of behavior. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, I think um, we'll move on then, Dee Dee. Okay, thanks, Helen. <laughs> okay, um, our actually our last uh, question that we had for today is, um, what are the required minimum hours for home instruction? Um, and I just want to say I've had um, multiple directors and folks reach out 
um, you know, over the year or past couple of years, as has Helen saying, I know this information, but I can't seem to find it anywhere. Um, and that happens so often. And sometimes things are in the operating standards, but I'm just going to take a second to say, not everything is spelled out in the operating standards. So it's okay if uh, don't, you know, don't feel bad if you say, I, I know that I saw this at one point in time, or I know I heard this, but I can't seem to find it. Some things are in the Ohio Revised Code, and there are even some things that are um, in like the Ohio, uh, I forget the name of it now, but the Ohio Administrative Laws, but it's not necessarily the Revised Code. Um, that's more for like healthcare uh, things. But when it comes to like delegated nursing and things like that, that's actually where that language is found. So um, so I just wanted to throw that out there because sometimes I, I know, um, sometimes Helen and I have to dig for things too. And, you know, it's, I mean, we spend most of our time uh, being up to date on where everything is and we have to dig sometimes. So I just wanted to say that, that, you know, don't feel bad if you uh, are kind of scratching your head. Like, I don't know where, I don't know where this is and I can't find it. So the answer, the short answer to this is um, for the purpose of counting the um, average daily membership, um, it is five hours per week. Now a district may opt to do something more than that if that is something that the student um, can tolerate and needs, uh, but at minimum, it is five hours. So again, I we always like to show you where things are. And this is one of those cases where that is not spelled out clearly in the operating standards, but it is in the Ohio Revised Code. And so uh, we're just giving you a little screenshot here of um, where that actually lives, where that language is. Okay, that is everything as far as the topics that we wanted to talk about today. So we are gonna just um, use our good wait time skills and uh, wait quietly for a minute or two to give you an opportunity to either put something in the chat or obviously unmute yourselves and ask a question. Um, and if at any point in time, anyone wishes for us to formally stop the recording and then you have something you wanna discuss off the record, we're happy to do that as well. Hi, ladies. It's Liz. Hi, Liz. I'm going to apologize in advance. I've got a family of birds literally right outside my window. And when they get <laughs> fed, it is so loud. It's almost crazy. <laughs> that's so okay. If you, so if you hear some weird background noise, that's what it is. It's a sign um, of spring. <laughs> it is. And I'm so excited for that. Okay. I have a question. Um, I was part of the um, scholarship office hours uh, last week or so. Yes, and was... yes but I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Liz, but um, somebody else had called me and said they were part of that. And I asked them to please let Didi and I know when those are, because we never hear about them and we want to be on them so we can get some information too. But sorry for yes. interrupting. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, they will they will be resuming next year. So okay, um, you can go on to their off their website, the inter or the monitoring, and they're listed at all the the recordings are in there and everything. Oh great! Um, but there was an extremely heated conversation, and I don't know if anybody else on here was part of this uh, regarding transportation for scholarship kids. Okay. Um, and. I was always told, and I brought this up, I said, you know, the only thing, I know there's all these different house bill things and transportation for non, you know, chartered on all that. And some of these scholarship providers are saying they're, they're non-chartered, but they're also getting scholarship dollars. Right. And the only thing I see actually in writing, and we hold strong on this in our district, we do not provide transportation to scholarship kids. Mm -hmm. We say transportation is part of FAPE, and when you take those scholarship dollars, you relinquish your right to FAPE. And I reference in the, o the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce 2023 FAPE comparison chart, exactly that language in writing. Okay. Um, um, so, so my thing is this conversation came up and the scholarship office people were saying, we're going to have, we have to provide transportation. Well, it blew up. 
Yeah. It, um, it was like the directors were like, there's no way, there's no way we're doing that. There's absolutely no way. They said, it doesn't matter if it's a 30 minute, you know, whatever, they could be right next door. Transportation is part of FAPE. Okay. I'm going to yeah. let Dee Dee take part of this because we had we, something similar come up and we went to DEW, OEC, or scholarship. And Dee, Dee, I don't think we got an answer, did we? Right, right. So Liz, everything you said is spot on. Um, yeah. You are absolutely right. It is not yeah. defined yes. in the operating standards. The rule of law has always been when you take a scholarship, you mm -hmm. cut ties with the district and you yeah. relinquish your right to fate. Then yeah. that extends to services and mm -hmm. transportation if we're talking about transportation, it is on the IEP, it's a related service. And we do not provide related services right. to students on scholarship because, as you said, it's part of FAPE. So, right. so you're exactly right. So this there this is not the first time there's been a very heated conversation around this this year. So yeah. what happened was mid-year this year, mm -hmm. out of the blue, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. Someone from uh, the scholarship office uh, said, well, as part of one of the house bills, and I apologize, I don't remember which one off the top of my head. House Bill 33. Yes, that, you know, <laughs> that, that would include that um, there had to be transportation for scholarship kids. Now, I, as you said, there was immediate and very, uh, <laughs> very robust, vehement mm -hmm. backlash to that uh, because it is in stark contrast to what the law provides for so but, but that did, house bill doesn't spell out itself no, it, spells doesn't. Out for that. it doesn't spell out it applies to those scholarship students correct because that correct. is a whole different ball game exactly right and we did yeah. helen and i looked we scoured through house mm -hmm. bill 33 um mm -hmm. when this debate first came up and we were getting hit as you can imagine oh. multiple phone calls multiple emails um and we took time and read very carefully through everything and it does not specify scholarship students. So our interpretation is that, uh, you know, some folks from the scholarship office were making a very broad mm -hmm. assumption mm -hmm. of that house bill language. And again, what we can tell you is Helen even mentioned this, that, um, and it's, you know, it, it's public record, so I'm, we're not going to, it's okay to say, we were actually at an OAPSA conference, right. and there were uh, folks from DEW present, and they do a, a little Q&A thing at the end of the day, and this very question got brought up earlier in the afternoon, and they sort of deferred and said, we'll get back to you in the later session in the afternoon. Well, they didn't. And what that tells us is there is not clear, there's not a clear answer at the department right now. Yep. And so yeah. what you said you heard is what we're going to tell you that yeah. we have heard districts say until someone puts it in writing and says, this is part of the law and part of the operating standards. And there's a change. We're not going to do it because yeah. that is in, again, in stark contrast to what the law, the provision of the law has has always been and continues right. to be. And yeah, so right. that's what we're telling people is that, you know, right. we can't tell you what to do. Uh, obviously you make that decision locally, but we a hundred percent understand why districts are saying, no, we will not do this until it is clear that there has been a change in law. And right yeah. now it is not clear that there has been a change in law. So if, you know, again, we, we're not going to, we're not, we're not trying to go against the scholarship office. Obviously, we're not trying to say anything contrary, but what we would say is that in our investigation of House Bill 33, you are correct. There is not specific language. And so we would be in agreement with LEAs saying, no, this is not covered under the law and therefore we will not do it because no. it we defer back to, it is not a part of FAPE. Of FAPE. When you take scholarship right. dollars, you surrender and your right to fate. So um, I think for honestly, what Helen and I have said, we've had people, we've had people come in uh, to our office in person to talk about this with us. And yeah. we literally have say, that's where we end the conversation is yeah. we, we agree with you. We support what you're saying until such time as there is something 
clearly defined in the law that changes that, then we hold that you are correct. And we would say, if you've made the decision that you will not do it, we think that you are correct legally in saying so. Yeah, I've gotten, I actually took the language right from that FAPE comparison. And I referenced that in my PR1s for those scholarships. Those scholarship okay. PR ones, I take it right from there saying this, we do not, they relinquish their right to FAPE the minute they take those dollars. Those schools are getting so much money. Exactly. Well, I mean, autism is like almost three, four thousand dollars or three, three thousand dollars. It's crazy. Well, yeah. and again, we don't want to say anything and, and we are recording this for posterity. So yep. we, we we certainly support scholarship providers. Yeah. We support the rights of parents to, to have options and yes. those choices. And we know that uh, there are students who need those separate settings who do in fact need uh, those very specialized services that you know cannot necessarily be provided in the district. And so right. while, while we all, I think districts, directors, you know, all of us support that, that process, we have to be careful that we don't overstep what the law allows for. And that's what I hear you and other directors yeah. saying okay. is that now when you're dragging transportation in, it is an overstep of what the provision of the law provides. And we're not going to do that unless there is a change in law. And so, yeah. like I said, that's ultimately where we would say okay. that, that's that conversation that's where we stand. And that's, that's what we say. We, we don't go into detail about it. We just kind of state the facts. This is what we have in writing and this is what we're going with. And we move on. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liz. Do we have any other questions out there? Or should we stop the recording and maybe take questions? Okay, well, Helen, I don't see anything in the chat. And since we don't have any other further questions right now, um, I think officially then um, right. we are going to say thank you so much. Oh, wait, we do have something in the chat. Oh, no, it's a thank you from Liz. Oh, okay. All right. So we're going to say thank you to all of you, uh, not only for joining us on our session here in the month of May, but, you know, many of you mm -hmm. join us every month or when you're able to. And um, we, you know, we appreciate that. We have also heard from folks who are not able to join us uh, when we do this live, but they go back on our YouTube channel and watch all of our office hours every month. So um, we appreciate your time. And uh, before we stop recording, we just want to say that we wish you all a very peaceful and restful summer break. We know that you're working hard over the summer, but we hope that you do take uh, some substantial time for self-care, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah. And I just, I want to reiterate what Dee, Dee said, but I also want to uh, say, please, because we've heard from um, a few teachers that aren't able to get on office hours. And we've always said, just go to your special ed director or whoever might be a supervisor at your um, district. And if they don't have the answer or whatever, or think it's something good to bring up on the office hours, or if it's something we have to answer immediately, you guys know how to get in touch with us, um, you know, send those in advance and we can um, provide some of those questions. I mean, those answers, sorry, but yeah, definitely everybody um, I'm sure is looking forward to the end of the school year and a nice, peaceful, relaxing summer.